Hi and welcome to my talk about thread pool elements at Meeting C++ 2024. And my goal with this talk is kind of to, you know, give you a bit of an overview on what I've been working on regarding thread pools, um, prototyping mostly and what I've learned. So let's get into this. Um, so one of the questions I was thinking about is like how to write a thread pool in 20, right? And I've started then prototyping in Compiler Explorer and I figured out that while this basically was kind of working, um, it also didn't really work because there were some issues, which are now cleared. So I'll be talking about that too. Um, and on the way, I noticed that there is a lot of things about concurrency, which you can learn with that and see in the elements. And so, yes, uh, this was a lightning talk, which I now expanded to be a full talk um, about those elements and thoughts on them to go into depth um, because another talk for the conference was needed. And I'm generally working on this right now. So this experiment got me started thinking about just, you know, concurrency, thread pools, and what we currently can do with C++. And through this, uh, the opinion came together that a thread pool is a generalized or special case of the producer consumer pattern. And hence, I will start with just looking at like, you know, how is this usually set up? What are the, the means of things we use with that? So the consumer is usually, you know, producer consumer overview. Um, this pattern is pretty common. Um, you have like one or multiple threads which are producing work items and these then notify um, the consumers or the consumers just randomly wake up and see what the work is, what they have to do. Um, and sometimes you have a back channel, but that again, you know, that's optional. And you have either one consuming thread, like a logging thread writing a log, or you have multiple threads which consume things. Um, and they can consume different things, but they also can just generally consume the same, same thing. Um, but this is a very general overview on, you know, the, the high level workings of this and connected usually is there in between a thread safe container and so let's you know look how a very simple thread safe container is looking when we use the adapter pattern which is a popular way to do this um so here we see like the two main member functions of this container class, which you know has some creative name like thread safe key or something. Um, and for my example, I decided that I want to implement a FIFO uh, thing, which you know first in first out. So I decided because pushback is just you know what we usually use to add things to something. We grow at the end and we take from the start. Um, both of those operations are protected by the same mutex. And basically, every other member function you add to this, like a size function, would be like the minimum, I think, um, kind of needs to protect the use of the container, which by itself is not thread safe, but you know, you're, you're, you're using an adapter to add the threat safety to this container. And the notification then usually is done by a condition variable, right? You have notify one and you have notify all which both make sense for a thread pool, but we'll be talking about that later. Um, and here's just some sort of code, you know, um, you have your uh, 
producer, which runs as long as there's something to produce. You have your thread safe key and you have the condition variable. And then when you produce an element, you either, you know, notify your consuming threads. And if there's only one thread, notify one makes sense. Um, it may also make sense to produce a batch and then notify the threads that the new batch is available. And that's generally something you have to figure out on what the size of your workload should be um, and how the general overhead of those functions in your threading implementation is. That's things to you know figure out to measure um, when you implement that. And the consumer basically takes references to these variables. And as long as it can consume, which, you know, that's up to the implementation to decide how, how that is handled. Um, and if the container where we're consuming from is empty, we use a condition variable to wait that the container is not empty anymore. And this is like really a very simplified implementation. Um, it would make sense to have like an internal counter to um, use here something like wait four or something that also like times out the wait um, to generally then see if, you know, what should we do then, or should we always wait on this condition variable? Um, and if there's a condition variable, you know, if there's an element available, we call pop, load the element in our thread, and then do something with it. And there are generally a few examples of use cases for this. I've already mentioned like the logging thread, which is a classic. Uh, QPainter can only draw in one main thread. So that's like usually the main thread. And when you have um, some functionality where you draw multiple images, then um, unfortunately this has to block the main thread, but um, you can then send the image to the thread pool or to the consumer in this case, and just write those image files to disk in a different thread. And often this is like something which consumer producer do. Uh, the producer does something lightweight and then doesn't want to, you know, the producer can be lazy. The producer creates the work item and the blocking work then happens in the consumer. And as I said, sometimes this is just something which happens and sometimes you want to have a channel which goes back to the producer or to, to some other place in your program to um, block errors or to be informed about errors or to react on errors or to um, turn the consumer again in a producer. Um, which basically then brings us into something like chain processing, right? Um, the consumer may also be a producer. First producer reads video frames and the consumer in, in, in the middle kind of, you know, it consumers, it consumes those video frames in resizing them and adds them to a new key. And that key is then used by the end consumer, which then puts those and writes them into a video stream, which either goes out on the network or onto a file or maybe into a screen or something like that. You know, that, 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 that depends. And so you can like, you know, complicate that in any way. And the thread pool is a service to run work items in parallel. And the owning thread of the thread pool is the producer from a simplified point of view. 
Um, of course, you can have multiple threads uh, have a reference or a pointer to your thread pool. Um, Qt, for example, has a global thread pool, which you can just create an instance to, and then you can access it. Or you can create your own thread pool, which is just that local variable. Um, so let's look at the elements for a, thrimple, for a simple thread pool, but also let's think like what would be the options to you know have it not as simple. The work items or like our units of execution, which we want to have is in the simple way in my implementation, I've simply decided to have a function which holds a void function without arguments. Um, this is when you look also like into the implementations you find on the net, a very popular choice. You do not have to um, deal with return values and basically all the argument wrapping is left to the user, which you know is none of your business as a thread pool. You just execute things in Prowler and that's done. Um, then I use a deck because vector does not have pop front. Um, but I thought it kind of, you know, is something useful to use in this context for a prototype. Uh, key and SD list are probably things you should look at when you actually want to use it for production. And that's probably I should add, that's not my goal. I, I am not trying to write a thread pool. I'm trying to understand how a thread pool works and how the mechanisms um, work together and maybe how this can be used in different contexts. Um, you also could like use a priority key because uh, the simple thread pool at the moment cannot um, prioritize an item. Sometimes you have just things where it doesn't matter, like mm, write this to disk and you don't, don't really care for this when it's written just that, you know, this, a certain time frame should be given that this is on disk and that you ensure that this happens, but it's not like it should be the next thing executed. But then on the other hand, maybe you have execution items which go to the network and might be more um, of a timing issue that you know maybe it's a chat message and the other thing is a log file and you want to send the log file to the log file but the chat message is better if it's like you know directly uh, written to the network and then priority key would make a sense but there are alternatives to using just a simple thing like a void function. Um, and there are good use cases for it. Um, I've mentioned QThreadPool already, and I think QThreadPool goes a different way. And I'm, I'm, I'm often using this. Um, you define your own runner class in QThreadPool, and it drives from a runnable type, which basically is the execution context type, which runs things. And you need to overload and override the run method. And then you choose which code you want to execute in this class in that thread pool. And then you create an instance of the class and give it to the thread pool. And um, when you want to return something, you also derive from Q object. And then you can emit a cute signal to the you know to the world and when the the thread that creates the instance of runner then can subscribe to that signal and receive that signal in a slot and then execute the reaction to that signal um also in that context you can manage ownership the QThread pool allows the runner to outlive its execution or to be destroyed after. And you can kind of set what the default is and you kind of can set what uh, a single instance of this class should do. So 
using function void is good for simple things and learning how a thread pool works, I think it's ideal. Uh, if you want to go for more complicated things, then a context type, which actually you know, run, is wrapping things, is good. Um, and function void forces the user basically to put everything into a lambda and then you know do what they actually want to do. Um, but in this case, you should be aware that, of course, well, the user needs to be aware. You as a thread pool author doesn't need to be aware, but the author, need, the, you need to like, uh, inform the, the user that you need to be aware that when you use a lambda, like many people will use here, um, the binding of the arguments to the lambda might cause some issues because you need to guarantee that those things do not go out of scope and you basically execute this in parallel somewhere outside of your control in a different thread. So when, for example, you know, one, one and three are copied, they're fine. But when you take a reference to two um, and you, you know, schedule this and then two goes out of scope is destroyed, um, that captured reference is still there and then you have a memory issue. And you, of course, can provide a more complex execution context type, right? Um, you could handle return values with some promise, for example, because it also would be a, enable you to return an exception which you catched, um, which is a different topic we'll talk about later. Um, you wrap an invocable in an internal setup to run whatever this is, um, you then need to think about lifetime. Um, the default is that your thread pool handles lifetime and things get moved or copied into your thread pool and then they run and then they get destroyed or maybe they stick around and you know people can uh, query the type later. Um, all kinds of options exist here. Um, And the basic setup would be like something like this. Uh, you have the invocable type, you have a promise type, which could be optional because um, when you handle return values, you also have to handle void. And that is not a value, right? So think about that. Um, error handling is something you probably also want to handle and maybe have this, uh, you know, be a default, but also be able to be changed by the users. So you have a strategy pattern here. Classic use for strategy pattern. Um, then you have this in, a, in, in one or multiple keys. Um, if you have a simple one key where everything is shared through the threads, then you have a lot of contention and locking on this container. And you can um, lower this by using one key per runner thread. And so the contention on the main, you know, on, on this one shared thread for all the threads you have um, gets reduced. This, in my opinion, also would like enable you to implement something like work stealing if one thread has an empty container and it's you know not busy anymore. It could have some mechanism in the thread pool to enable looking into other containers for threads to copy work items to the thread, which is at the moment ready to execute the next work item. Um, and I expect there's many variations and like if, if you want to do things like that, um, you will need to have, and I do have, we'll get to this, you actually like need to have a context class for the thread itself. And at the moment, the I, I kept it simple, my implementation has just one thread. 
in one and not, not one thread but um, one container um, and as we saw with the consumer and producer pattern again um, we need a condition variable uh, which is used to signal about new available work and just quickly want to mention here that condition variable any is also like an alternative. This depends on which mutex you use and often STD mutex is used, but if you use a different mutex, you also will have to um, use this condition variable because the normal condition variable is unfortunately only able to accept the STD mutex. And that's what I currently wrote. With. I, I just have an std mutex um, because that's basically the functionality I need um, for the simple work. Um, there are alternative mutexes. There is a timed mutex which allows you to lock with a timeout and then, you know, um, it may make sense to have a counter in a thread how often, uh, if you use this, how often you time out. And if you timed out the working thread, which, you know, just executes item n times, you might think about if you should shut down the thread or if it's, you know, you don't need that if, if you keep it running, but if you, you know, want to be responsible with your resources, then time mutex could be, you know, enabling you there. Um, recursive mutex protects you against deadlocks when you have a class which has a mutex and you go in the same thread into a recursion and call a function which has been pri prior called and is currently holding a lock mutex, okay? And then you could enter a code section and lock the same mutex again and not be deadlocked. Um, when you use the adapter pattern, you may want to think about using the recursive mutex, even if right now this doesn't happen, because adding a function who calls a locking member function when you, you know, do all your things or some coworker adds something, um, doesn't have to be you. It's like someone in the future will add something which happens to cause this bug, uh, recursive mutex um, may help with that because there's, there's a lot of other bugs which people can add, right? Not, not every bug will, will be solved by recursive mutex. Shared mutex is great when you have like a lot of reading in parallel. Um, like say you, you share a certain configuration, for example, with all threads. And this configuration is not constant. This configuration can change and might get updated, like, you know, once an hour, once a minute, doesn't matter. Um, shared mutex is great for having a lot of reads and they can happen in parallel. But when you have a change to that uh, section, which is locked by a shared mutex, then the lock is unique. And that's something nice. I also should mention that um, under Windows, mutexes have a bit of an ABI issue, and you probably should look this up for your usage in Visual Studio. Um, that std mutex, for example, is in memory a little bit bigger than shared mutex. And so if you have a lot of mutexes which get allocated, like in a vector or something in a container, and you want to have a smaller memory footprint, because cache lines and stuff, um, then it is worth to see if shared mutex improves things for you because it just has a significant smaller memory footprint. 
And so much about new taxes for now. Um, then there is a nice C20 feature, which is stop source and stop token. The stop source is something which you have in, in one thread or multiple threads shared. Um, and you can get then a token which belongs to the source. And in, in other threads, you now simply can you know give this to the, the, the way this is handled is like other threads run as long as the stop token is not requested, right? And this enables you to have a nice mechanism to have a clean shutdown of certain threads. So that like, the, the main thread holds the stop source or the producer holds the stop source, and then you can shut down other threads that just, you know, are working in parallel for you. And that's really a nice thing. One addition to that is stop callback, which you then, um, you can add a callback to a stop token. And these execute when the stop is requested or when the stop already has been requested. And the execution threat is either the threat invoking stop source to stop the threats, right? To request the stop. Or if stop token is already being invoked and the stop source, you know, has fired and it's requested that it stops, um, then basically stop token says, well, I'm, I'm not going to um, forward this into the stop source. I'm going to execute it directly in the thread that holds the current um, stop token and is adding this. So this is then executed in the constructing thread. Um, you can have multiple of those. So there's then no order of execution guaranteed when you um, and also like you can have them on the stack as a stop callback and if in the time of the existence of the stop callback is not fired and it gets destructed then it's not going to execute. So you can use this as a multi-threading safe um, scope exit. So when you need to make sure that some something gets executed when the threat is called to stop, that works in the context. But if you you know want to just protect the section with that, and then this doesn't need to be executed anymore, shouldn't be executed anymore then the destruction of the stop callback will not fire um, if the threat is still you know, not requested to stop. And I currently do not use this. Um, I'm not sure what should be that useful for. Um, of course, you could like, you know, before you start executing something, you, you could create a stop callback and then do something with it. But I don't have this functionality in the moment, as it's a simple thread pool. Um, and generally, I have not seen a good usage example for this. Uh, but Runner Grimm's block is a great source for this and other threading features in general. I want to give him a shout out here. Um, then in my thread pool, I have an atomic int, which is a counter for how many threads are working right now. And I kind of use this to know, should I add another thread? Because my thread pool actually does not start with like idle threads. At the beginning, it doesn't have any thread. And when you add workload to it, it allocates more um, threads. And in order to know how many threads I uh, need to be executing at maximum Hardware concurrency gives me that answer. And that way I could find out on Compiler Explorer, this is two. 
And this now is basically the simple thread pool class. We have the deck with the function void holding our work. We have the condition variable. We have the mutex. We have a stop source to basically stop our work. And we have the atomic int for just knowing if and how many threads are working at the moment. And then I do have a max threads for hardware concurrency, which is the way I, as a simple thread pool, think it makes, makes sense at the moment. Um, and I have an internal class of in thread pool, which is the thread context. And this holds to many of these references. It has a stock token, which it gets from the thread pool. And then it has references to uh, the work container, to the condition variable, to the mutex, to the working um, atomic int. And it has a unique pointer where it actually holds the thread it's executing in. Um, and that's the current setup for this. And the thread pool then has this thread context class in a vector. And this has been the source uh, of some of the issues I saw with the success and the memory issues that I had. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning with um, Compiler Explorer. So I then was like, hmm, maybe I had a reserve and this should go away. And it did go away. Um, I'll talk about uh, like what exactly caused this in a minute, because here we are at the Lambda capture. So um, this is the source of the memory issues. Because I do call start thread and capture this. And this works very fine. There's no problem with this. The problem comes when a vector which is not reserved on the maximum um, threat items we want to allocate for, then uh, the growing vector at some point will reallocate memory and lead to the wrapping class being moved. And the unique pointer where we hold the STD thread in, which holds the lambda, um, holds this pointer which points to an element in the vector which has been reallocated and hence is just somewhere in memory which isn't valid anymore. Um, so when you capture this or use the ampersand capture, which just captures like the local surrounding, basically the stack, what the lambda is created on, uh, be careful. This leads to memory issues and errors. Um, And adding reserve makes this go away. But it does not clear this issue totally. Because while the allocation of this memory is now handled, and you don't move this memory around, and the pointers you give to the lambdas are staying valid, you can now grow the number of threads without other instances having memory corruption issues. But also, you can only remove the last thread. Okay, when the when you have like four threads in this, and you want to remove the second thread, which I'll show you later, that will lead to issues. And I. Favorite solution, of course, which does not have this issue. And I'm, you know, don't have the time as organizing the conference right now to really look into this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this is possible. Um, but the cur current prototype has one of the, this one of the issues with the current prototype. Um, and I thought like reference repo will help with the references to move them and um, it doesn't help with lambda capture. So you would need to be able to factoring out the lambda. And so 
that then brings me to wondering when I have like, you know, uh, not a Lambda, I need a call operator, which is executed in the thread. And the thread is owned by the instance of the operator. And when I then call the move constructor, when this operator is executing in a different thread, do I need to have a locking? Do I need to lock the move constructor? Might, do I need to have a lock in this context, into this thread context class, which protects this class when it's moved or executing something in the thread? And my, I think the answer is yes. And this is basically what, what, we look, what we're looking at, right? We have those four threads which are executing items. And now um, we are deciding that a thread that does not have anything to do anymore and is waiting for a certain amount of time at some point um, is able to tell the thread pool, hey, thanks, but I, you know, like to stop executing my thread. And maybe you decide that then you want to free also that memory. Um, you could, of course, like just, you know, have like a free list. And the next time you start up a thread, you reuse this and then you don't have the memory issue. Um, but then you still, if you want to dynamically grow this array with threads during your runtime, um, and not have it like as a fixed allocation with one reserve, um, you run in the same issue when you grow it, right? So in this case, we want to have this as dynamic memory. And now um, it's not the thread, which is basically shut down, which gets an issue. It's the uh, three and four threads, which now get moved. Boom, right? And they now um, have this pointer, which either points to, so if you capture this, if you do this with my current implementation, thread three will point to something, but thread four then will be in the memory area where uh, thread three was and this will cause also very interesting issues. Um, and this is the result what we end up with. So, and we should ha have in mind that, you know, threads will potentially keep executing during this, right? Maybe they're sleeping, maybe they are waiting on a lock, then we can update things, but um, they might be, you know, uh, be running and might be um, accessing the variables they have access to in the execution function. And yeah, as I said, that's something I want to look into. And that is, as I mentioned, an issue at the moment. And to basically, you know, get this into a more pronounced state, um, I have to move out of Godbolt and Compile Explorer to, you know, create a CMake project with init and maybe use colon to bring in some other variables and things I want to do with that. Um, but that's for the future. I do also should talk about error handling. I already mentioned great opportunity to use the to use a pattern, um, but you need to protect the thread pool and the executing threads uh, against exceptions from the payloads you execute. So, of course, you, you know, my workloads don't throw, it's all easy, great. So we don't need to do that. But when you, extend this, you need to, to think about the error handling. And basically a simple try catch block 
would do. Um, you'd have to decide if the thread pool should do anything with those errors or not. Because um, if you decide to do something with it, you would have to implement all the error handling. And that's complex. Um, the clients of the thread pool should be doing this work, right? They should be caring. Um, you only get the, to see the errors and especially the exceptions which, which escape your payloads. And so in an ideal work, all of the error handling is done by the invoked function in your payload. Um, and the things that escape is something which are exceptions which are not catched there, which is bad, but you need to kind of make sure that this is handled. And if you have a execution context type, you basically could, you know, somehow arrange that everything is executed through a mechanism that then, you know, gives this context the exceptions which it forgot to catch in its payload. Um, and the strategy pattern, as I mentioned, is a great way to you know give users some control here to say, hey, what should happen with those um, exceptions? If you decide to have like you know error handling in the thread pool, then you need to like you know do all the things with, with every error. Um, but from my point of view, that's not your job. That's the job of the of your clients, right? Whoever gives you something to execute and it explodes in your thread pool, they didn't do their job. But you need to be able to continue running in that case and not just have a thread which is now uh, having called std terminate, which then probably also propagates into your program. And it's not so nice. Um, Advantage of an SCD execution type is that you can basically have a promise which has that exception which escaped or the return value. Um, signal libraries exist, so return values can also be handled by a signal. Um, but that is basically um, the job of your user and not your own. Um, and, and then in our time frame where we are living, we should you know mention senders receivers and SED execution. We do have a talk on the conference about that, um, which is interesting. And I have to say, I don't know so much about it that I don't want to go too deep into it. Um, this is a paper, the current version, and this is their Hello World example, um, where I already, like in the second line, wonder what the hell is scheduler auto sh um and is it just pseudo code or is this like a, a language edition which i'm not aware about i think it's like actually available in a library so you don't have to wait to this being in uh, 26 which it is but um yeah so if you're interested in that um we have a talk on that and you can look into that um Then these are the benefits of execution according to P2300 in the current revision. And the authors say here that um, compared to the old models, uh, they offer proper hooks for transitioning between execution resources, which is nice. Um, they seem to support adopters, adopters, and they have something like let value, uh, which I totally don't know what that is, but it sounds nice. Um, they have a separation of an error channel from the value channel, um, which they think is a good idea, and I think they they have a reason to to do that. And then they mentioned that they also have something for futures, which you know, um, chaining things with then when all or when any is also interesting, which is, you know, something you do when you have schedulers and, and stuff like around. 
as the execution is something really interesting and enables you to do far more with concurrency uh, than we can do today um, and in a much better way. But this is not the topic of the talk. I, I do quickly want to go into coroutines. Um, they're powerful. I haven't used them. Uh, they offer better control flow, the lightweight, but also I think they are out of context for concurrency a little bit. Um, they help with concurrency in a certain way, but the coroutine does not make your code magically threat safe, in my opinion. Um, so that that's like my personal opinion that you know coroutines help you to have things better be executed and the control flow um but at the moment they are not that uh, used in our language so usually this is seen as a lightweight passing of uh, not having the, the heavy investment in threats. Um, I'm looking very much forward to have better coroutines in, in future standard versions, but for the context of the threat pool, I think it's at the moment out of context. And, you know, some lessons learned. And yeah, so mostly I do an exercise here to learn about concurrency and threat pools. I do and will keep using Q threat pools and the Q threat pool class and lots of programs, but I could write my own now. Just, you know, it was an interesting experiment and I probably continue uh, doing it to you know, gain some more insights into the questions and issues I have, but also in just in general in how to build this. Um, I did use the sanitizers and both the threat sanitizer and the memory sanitizer uh, catched this issue with uh, Lambda Capture. And at first I didn't know what it exactly was pointing at or showing me because it just, you know, shows the part of the memory is corrupted and um, the limitation of Compiler Explorer is a bit that you don't really know like what, what is happening. Um, and I'm not very much used to, to work with sanitizers. Um, so, you know, be careful with lambda captures and then moves, etc. Uh, understand the underlying dynamics of containers, which I do, but sometimes just, you know, you happen to see that this uh, thing strikes again, which can be easily overlooked when you're just doing prototyping. Um, so the vector reallocates moves and copies when growing. Lambdas might hold on to old memory when you capture things by reference. And capturing this, just again, the slides, you know, this or using ampersand to basically capture the local surrounding um, is a bit of a thing you have to see if this potentially could lead to memory issues and errors. And Compiler Explorer is really nice for prototyping, but it only offers two threads, which is enough for testing. But then at some point you, you know, want to make your prototype better and have it like in a proper environment. Um, like for example, I one thing I currently don't have is like tests. I, I want to add then tests to the project and run tests and that's another question I'm thinking about right now. What and which things I should test for the threat pool and how should I test them? And that's basically it at the moment. Thank you for listening.